Good morning. So back in February, um, the Super Bowl happened. And I, as a pacifist, just absolutely hate football. But one thing I do do is I pay attention to the halftime show. I love music, and I'm, I'm super curious of how they're going to perform and what songs they're going to sing. And so, you know, for the past, I don't know, maybe five years, whenever the Super Bowl happens and my husband gets super excited and he wants to gather his friends and maybe he'll even go someplace and watch it, I'll say, fine, fine, great. I'll get the house to myself. Go. But can you just do me a favor because I'm not going to pay attention. Will you text me? When the Super Bowl, when the halftime show starts, so I can just see what happens. And so the past couple of years, you know, it's been okay, it's been fine, but um, I was particularly excited about the most recent halftime show. Um, in fact, I was so excited about it because when my daughter came to me a, a couple of weeks before when they, when they announced who was going to be uh, performing, because um, the, the particular lineup just brought me right back to 1990s where I was just so full of joy and youth and I was just loving 90s hip hop music. Now, I come from a background where my dad really didn't encourage us to listen to any sort of like hip hop music or anything like that. Um, and so it also felt like a little bit of like me uh, having a little bit of independence when I would be out with my girlfriends and we would listen to, you know, one of the artists that was playing on, at the Super Bowl that, or the halftime show that, that Sunday. So my husband texts me and he says, it's happening. And I, come, I turn it on and, and it was exactly what I had hoped this geriatric millennial would experience. It was, it was fantastic. It was, it was, it was alive and fun and I was singing along and I was dancing along and I felt it in my body the next day that I should not have danced so hard during the halftime show, but it was beautiful. It actually was like a historic moment because it was the first time that, a hip, that the Super Bowl uh, halftime show was headlined by a fully hip hop um, group, like various hip hop artists. It was actually the first time it was entirely of hip hop headliners. And for those of you who don't know, there was like Dr. Dre and Snoop Dogg and Kendrick Lamar and Mary J. Blige and Eminem. And if anybody knows what Eminem looks like, he's like a white rapper, and he, is, he, he actually like looks very similar to what my husband looks like, so I, I tell people I was destined to adore that halftime show. So I, but then, you know, the halftime show happens, and I, I'm not into football, I don't care, whatever, touchdown, goal, hit, run the base, whatever. So the next thing I do is I jump onto Twitter and Facebook and Instagram, my favorite places to connect with people online to see if they loved the halftime show as much as I did, if they were sore as much as I was. And I, there was a variety of responses. People were like, that was captivating. That was electrifying. Somebody said, you know, as a 50 year old, it made me feel, come alive to see these 50 year olds getting up and doing that. I also saw things people that were saying like, it was disgusting. It was a stage full of felons. I'm appalled. The variety, the responses were so different. And when I think about the, the occasion that we are looking at in Acts, the, the event of Pentecost, I think, very ba I think back to those same responses to the halftime show. There was a variety of responses to what happened. There was exuberance and curiosity. There was disgust and frustration. There was fear and anger. And so today we're going to ask ourselves a question. What do we do as spirit-filled people when we encounter something that makes us uncomfortable, that asks us to be out of our comfort zone, that asks us to, to lean into curiosity because it's something we're not familiar with. Now, my husband and I have been together for 23 years. We've been married for 19 of those years. Um, and when we first got together, um, he 
and I were long distance. So we met in New Orleans, and if I'm feeling a little salty, if I'm just kind of like trying to gauge how somebody would respond to me, I'll say, I met my husband during Mardi Gras, and then I just watch, like I watch their reaction to see like where, where their, their brain goes. And then I'll say, no, 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 he wasn't throwing beads at me during Mardi Gras. We met uh, at a, doing uh, urban core development work. We met at a school um, that prided themselves in con working deeply and closely and intentionally with those who are marginalized in our community, the poor, the homeless, um, the drug addicted, um, and working primarily to undo some of the brokenness that we see in the urban core. And I am from a small town, like you heard me say, a rural town in Texas. Um, and then I went to a suburban church in North Texas for college. So I had no background and no experience. And you know, if you remember, my dad really shielded our family from some of those influences. And so when I went into it, I went into it very much like, I am gonna bring the gospel of Jesus to these people. I'm gonna tell them how to get their life right I'm going to expose to them all the wrong choices that they're making. And then after a week, they're going to know Jesus. They're going to manage their, their, their money better. They're going to get off drugs. And then they're going to say it was because of that sweet 19-year-old girl who came that one week. Well, then I got there and I saw that it was much more complex than that. And I also met my husband, who had been doing urban core work for a long time and just really shook his head and laughed and said, you are idealistic, but you're also cute, so let's keep talking. <laughs> so we were a long distance. He went back to Illinois, and I went back to Texas. And this was before unlimited cell phones. So he would get a phone card, and I would get a phone card. We would take turns. And then we would be on the phone with each other, and we would wait for that you have two more minutes on this card. And then we'd be like, okay, wait, oh, like, let me finish the story, and then it's my turn, I'll call you back. So we did this, this was, the, this was how we fell in love. And so one of those times, my husband, or at that time, the, my boyfriend, and I were on the phone, and we both came from backgrounds where, um, in our churches at that moment, the book I Kissed Dating Goodbye was really popular. And so we both decided that we wanted to do this dating thing right. So we were going to court. And so we wanted to ask all of the questions that we would want a potential spouse on the phone with each other before we reconnected in person. And so one of those questions that I asked him, I was so, I was so proud of myself. Like all day long, I was like, ooh, I'm going to get this phone card. And then I'm going to ask this great question. And he is going to fall straight in love with me. So we get on the phone and, and we catch up and then it's, it's my turn to bring a question for us to talk about to help us discern what our life together would look like. And, and I realized that although he was, a, he was an intern, a pastoral intern at his church, I didn't hear a whole lot about how he worshiped in his church. I, I heard about the stuff that he did, the people he connected with, but I, I wanted a picture of what his Sunday morning looked like. So I said, tell me what you love about your church? And he said, oh, this is a good question. I was like, score. He said, I love talking about my church. He said, when I walk into my church in Champaign-Urbana, it's in the middle of a cornfield. And people from all different walks of life, from, from uh, the university, from the, from, the, from the farms, from the trailer park, they all come and they worship in our space together. And then when I walk in, there are flags along the side of our building of all of the nationalities that are represented in our congregation or where people in our congregation have gone to connect with other Jesus disciples. He said, my pastor gets up and he preaches sometimes in a dashiki because he spent some time pastoring um, in an African country in Ghana. And then he said, and then sometimes we sing in another language. And that makes me really uncomfortable because I don't, I don't sing really well. I'm really tone deaf. And I was like, I know, I heard you. That's okay. But he's like, I'm tone deaf, so I don't like to sing. But also, like, I don't, I don't like to sing in another language. I don't know exactly if I'm saying it right, pronouncing it right. And, and I don't want to offend somebody who's, that's their heart language if they hear me saying it wrong. But I do it. I do it because it's important. That is why I love my church. 
And I was like, wow, I did not prep a good enough answer in response to him. I was like, I, I love my church because we take communion every week. And, and, you know, I'm usually hungry by 1130, so. Then he described his church and the way that he felt in his church. It makes me think of Acts 2. It makes me think of this moment where people who had gathered all together in that space from different parts of the region with their different languages and their different garbs and the different foods that they brought with them, coming to that space, maybe being a, a little aware that they're entering into a space where um, they're, 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 they may not hear their heart language, Maybe even the way that they move through the world in their own cultural expression has caused them to be ostracized when they come into this multi, this multicultural, multi, uh, multi-language space. And yet, what happened was amazing. The evidence of the Holy Spirit, the evidence of the, the invitation of our calling to be spirit-filled came in the, the speaking and the hearing of different languages. So like I said, that, that moment, that event, the event of Pentecost had a variety of different reactions. There were people who were amazed to be able to hear the good works of God in their own language from somebody that they did not expect to speak their own language. But then some were disgusted and they sought to discredit it. And this makes sense. When we are uncomfortable, we have this cognitive dissonance where we, we, it, it feels almost painful to try to reconcile what is happening in front of us, and so we easily discredit it, or we easily opt out of it. So what was happening at, during that moment is something that we all experience even in this moment. But I love that Peter stood up and he sought to reframe that experience for those in attendance by checking their disgust with common sense and decency. Y'all, they're not drunk. It's only nine in the morning. But then he went on to quote, quote the prophet Joel, who helps everyone, to help everyone understand what was going on. And I really like the voice translation of Joel's prophecy of what it will look like when God's people are filled with God's spirit. So it says in the, in the, um, in the voice translation of the prophecy in Joel, it says, Then in those days I will pour out my spirit to all humanity. Your children will boldly and prophetically speak the word of God. Your elders will dream dreams. Your young warriors will see visions. No one will be left out. In those days, I will offer my spirit to servants, both male and female. Imagine with me the sense of comfort, of understanding, of belonging, that those who had come to Jerusalem felt upon hearing their heart language in a space and from, like I said, someone they did not expect to hear it. Maybe even from someone they expected to be resistant or annoyed. Willie James Jennings is one of my favorite theologians. He is an, an associate professor of systematic theology in Africana studies at Yale. And he is the writer of the best commentary of Acts I've ever read. And he highlights this moment and says that what was going on in this moment could be described as the sound of intimacy. Intimacy, the vulnerability of coming close, the ecstasy of creating an us-ness is at the heart of the gospel. It is our calling as Jesus' disciples to be as radically hospitable as Jesus was, to be as willing to be interrupted and as uncomfortable as Jesus was. Willing to die to ourselves as Jesus was. It's the only way that we can truly evaluate our mission to make sure that we are living into that prophecy of Joel that says, no one will be left out. 
And we are living, we can live into that by consciously depending on the Holy Spirit. Now, when I was first taught this passage, because I come from an Assembly of God background, it's a very charismatic, very Pentecostal background. When I was first taught this, I was taught that to be a disciple of Jesus, you had to speak in another language. They call it the initial physical evidence of your discipleship to Jesus, being able to speak in your prayer language. And I remember hearing this as a seven, eight-year-old and thinking, okay, when I get older, I'm going to be able to speak in another language. And then I went to youth camp, and the speaker for that week, I was about 12, and the speaker for that week, his whole goal, and he even said it the first night, my one goal is that every single one of you will have your prayer language by the time you go back home. And so little 12-year-old me found myself sitting at the altar weeping because I couldn't speak in another language. I would try, and I would try, and I would try, and nothing would come out. Or I would know, oh, I'm just making that up. I didn't sense the peace, the love, the welcome of the Spirit. I just sensed shame and discouragement and frustration. And that cognitive dissonance began to form. And speaking in a prayer language became a painful memory for me. I remember sitting there on Thursday night at the altar saying, God, you know I love you. I do all of these things for you. I tell people about you. I read my Bible. I sing and I sing in worship band. I give. I took my sister's spanking for her because I wanted to be like Jesus. (laughs) Why won't you let me speak to you? See, the problem with that introduction to this passage that the emphasis that we should be focusing on is the, ex- the, the extravagant uh, speaking, of in t- uh, speaking in tongues, the splashiness of it, robs us of our capacity to live into this passage every single day of our lives. What if the focus isn't just the speaking, but the hearing? Speaking in such a way where others can hear you and hear the love of Jesus? What if the invitation is that dying to yourself? Is that not evidence of the work of the Spirit in our lives? And honestly, there's no practicality to me walking around speaking in my prayer language all the time. I mean, if I took you to Starbucks and just busted out my prayer language, like, that would be mad awkward. You would be like, Oshita, no more espresso for you. What good and what help, what encouragement can come when we only focus on the splashy, big evidences of the Spirit? They are important, but they're not the only aspect of our spiritual formation. The tradition I came from limited our calling to be uh, a temple of the Holy Spirit to the speaking and the eating and the doing as an exploit of God's glory, but not just being. Being a presence of the radical, welcoming hospitality of God. Are we the kinds of people who make room for the other? Even others whose languages and cultures, ways of thinking and even worshiping is radically and quite possibly uncomfortable, uncomfortably different than ours. We have a holy invitation today to not just focus on the speaking, but the listening. A commitment to lean into discomfort and be bridge builders, to reach across the divides in amazing ways. In Jennings' commentary, He says that this moment, this Pentecost moment, was important because the early church was wrestling with three struggles. First, there was a political struggle. There was disagreements about the vision of their life together. And there was interpersonal struggle, disagreements about the vision of their faithfulness to God and their faithfulness to the gospel together. And then there were ecclesial Uh, struggles. 
disagreements about the vision of the mission of the church. And does this not sound like the state of our church and our world right now? We have rural churches and urban churches, and sometimes they don't get along or they judge each other for the ways that they worship or the mission that God has placed in those communities. We, have, we had a racial uprising that we are still figuring out how to be faithful disciples in the midst of. And so we are now asking ourselves questions about race and how race has infected the ways that we engage with each other. We are struggling with political disagreements. How can you be this and love Jesus? How can you be that and love Jesus? In this different stage of the pandemic, we're asking ourselves, what does worship look like? Masks on, masks off. Singing, no singing. In person, online, maybe online only because the future is technology. What if we were inspired and empowered by the Pentecost and listened to the Spirit's invitation to be radically hospitable, to speak in ways that are loving and welcoming and listen in ways that are loving and welcoming. I can't tell you how many times I've been asked, what are we supposed to do about dot, dot, dot. As a pastor, people come to me and say, I don't know how to be a follower of Jesus because of this. Or my brother said this and now I can't believe that he loves Jesus and so I want to block him. And when I receive a question like this, I try to understand the desires of the question asker. And I realize that oftentimes they want me to give them a quick fix, an easy answer. But that's almost as unrealistic and as unhelpful as only looking at the Pentecost as a splashy exploit of God's glory. They want a massive spectacle of might and power. I had this problem and I fixed it this way and now it's not a problem anymore. We often want the external big bang of creating a new, what, better way of being together that's free of all the divisions. But what if the way forward is quiet intimacy? The intimacy of breath and the tenderness of voice. This is a value that my husband and I, because he totally did fall in love with me over those phone calls, took into our relationship and then took into our parenting. Like I said, we met in New Orleans, and then when Hurricane Katrina happened, we evacuated. I was eight months pregnant with our second, so we had a three-year-old, and then we got to Boston, we had another baby as soon as we got to Boston, and then uh, three months later, hello, hi, I was pregnant again with our third baby. So when this happened, and we, be, and we were a new family pretty quickly in a new place, um, I decided that the best decision for our family, while my husband went to seminary and worked two full-time jobs, or two part-time jobs, was that I would stay home with the children. And so because of that, because I was investing so much time with my kids, my husband and I had extensive conversations about the kind of home culture that we wanted and what I could do to hold it down, to, to, to keep it up. And one of those values, being an interracial couple, I'm black, he's white, him coming from such a diverse, multi-ethnic church, me eating a lot of humble pie as an urban minister, learning from people who were different than me, decided that we wanted our children to have a a value of multiculturalism and multi-ethnicity and diversity. So this came up in a lot of ways in our family. We would worship in churches that were particularly invested in singing in different languages. My husband and I were attended a church led by a Korean American pastor. But one Sunday, one one experience that I had with my children helped me realize that um, this discomfort is something that we don't just grow out of. It's a commitment that we have to have every single day. So my husband took one of his part-time jobs was he worked at a church uh, in, in Boston and it was called Lion of Judah. And it was a church that was deeply committed to being a safe 
welcoming bilingual community. So there is an English speaking pastor, but then there is also a Spanish speaking pastor and people from pan Latino experience, from across the Latino experience, from um, Colombian to Cuban to Puerto Rican, uh, to even Mexican would, would come and worship at Lion of Judah. And how my husband got this job as a, as a, on staff at this church had nothing to do with his ability or lack thereof of speaking Spanish because the man can't speak a lick of Spanish. My husband was passionate about mentoring and particularly mentoring kids who were found, who were, who were from the urban core. And they had a mentoring grant that they received and they were beginning a program and my husband already had started a program so they hired him to build that program on site. And so part of his getting to know the community and also recruiting and inviting the community to come in and learn what he was doing with the youth was he would, come, he would go to their Sunday morning gatherings and do sort of a little spot, like here's what's going on in the church or here's what's going on in the organization. And one of those times my husband said, hey, I really want you to come. There's a, couple, there's a family that I've been working with that I want you to meet. I think, I think our kids will get along with their kids. So can you bring the kids to the worship gathering? And I said, sure, of course. So we brought our kids to the worship gathering and my son was about 10 years old, which meant, you know, I had a 10 year old, a seven year old and a six year old. And we're in the worship gathering, and I know, I knew that it was going to be multi-ethnic, I knew it was going to be multi-voice, and I knew that there was going to be multi-languages, and I prepped my kids. I said, we're going to be singing in different languages. But I'm sitting on one side of the pew, and my husband's next to me, and then my other three children are kind of like little ducks in a row right here. And we're singing, and a song in Spanish comes on. And it's a song that I know my children know in English. So I'm like, great, thank you, Lord. And as I'm singing, um, I, come to, I come to the chorus and I just happen to look over and I see a scowl over my son's face. And I see him fidgeting. And then he looks over at me and I look at him. And so he does that little scoochy thing that you do along the pew to get to me. And he pulls up my dress and he says, Mom, can we go? And I'm like, what? What's going on? Are you okay? And he's like, I, I don't want to be here anymore. I'm like, why? And he's like, I don't understand anything that's going on. I, don't, I, I didn't understand the story time. I didn't, I don't understand. I don't even understand the song. And I'm like, but you know this song. And I was like, listen. And as the song is going in Spanish and we're coming to parts of it that I knew, I was saying it to him in English. And I was like, listen, Jesus sounds the same in so many languages. Listen for Jesus. And he was like, I don't care, mom. I don't care. I want to go. Why do we have to be here, mom? I said, son, every Spanish speaker in this room knows what it's like to move through the world in a, in a way where people don't understand or are unwilling to speak their heart language. And when they come to this place, it's one of the few places outside of their homes where they meet with other people who are willing to sing in Spanish. And they are connecting to Jesus in a way that's really meaningful for them. And we're not leaving this space because we love them. So you can stay by my side. And as I understand things, I will tell you in English but we're gonna love our neighbor really well. And he sat down and he did a little huff thing. But then he leaned into me. And I realized at that moment that I needed to say that out loud just for myself. For when I am in spaces that I feel really uncomfortable because no one will be left out. In God's vision of belonging and the expansive family of God, no one is left out. May this be our prayer and our commitment when we think of living together as God's family filled with God's spirit of love. And in closing, I'm going to offer this one last thought from Jennings. He says, the same spirit that was there from the beginning, hovering, brooding in the joy of the creation of the universe. And each one of us who knows us together and separately in our most intimate places has announced the divine intention through the Son 
to reach into our lives and make, make each life a sight of speaking glory. But this will require bodies to reach across massive and real boundaries, cultural, religious, and ethnic. It will require a commitment born of Israel's faith, but reaching into depths of relating beyond what any devotion to Israel's God had heretofore been recognized as requiring. Devotion to peoples unknown and undesired. But God had always spoken to Israel. Now God speaks even more loudly in the voices of the many to the many. Join us. Join them. Now love of neighbor will take on a pneumatological dimension. It will be love that builds directly into the resurrected body of Jesus. It will be love, as Karl Barth says, that goes into the far country. This is love that cannot be tamed, controlled, or planned. And once unleashed, it will drive the disciples forward into the world and drive a question into their lives. Where is the Holy Spirit taking us and into whose lives? So part for you. My fellow brothers and sisters, co-laborers for the kingdom, I leave you with this last question. Where is the Holy Spirit taking us and into whose lives? Amen. Thank you.